secure, safe, secure, environmentally friendly shipping all over the world, and his excellent achievements as Secretary General of the IMO. Please, Secretary General, the floor is yours, and thank you for your attention. I wish you all a fruitful day. Thank you, Jorgen, for your kind words of uh, introduction. Now let me address you in your official title, Chairman of the AMSA Administrative Board, Executive Director of AMSA Excellencies, Secretary of State of Poland, Admirals, representatives of the European Parliament, the European Commission, IEX, and the EC Shipowners Association, heads of uh, international and national shipping organizations, fellow speakers, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you today, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity both to participate in this conference and on a more personal level to be here to bid farewell to my friends and colleagues for many years, Jürgen and Willem. This is a gathering that I would not miss for the whole of the world. I have been asked uh, to speak on the contribution that a regional agency such as EMSA can make to a global issue, namely safety and clean ship, safe and clean shipping. If you'll permit me, I might add secure to that list too. Not only are these aspirations of vital importance to international ship on trade and the industry, they are also universal. We can all espouse them and we can all strive to achieve them. And because of this, an important obje objective for me during my time as Secretary General of IMO has been to build a harmonious working relationship between the organization, that is, shipping's global regulator, and bodies that have regional responsibilities in this regard. Let me say from the outset that the response I have had from Europe collectively has been exemplary and as such has been for me a source of great satisfaction. I do not think anybody could dispute the need for an international agency with a global mandate to regulate shipping at the global level. It stems from the fact that shipping is perhaps the most international of all the great industries of the world. The ownership and management chain surrounding any particular vessel can embrace many different countries. It's not unusual to find that the owner, operator, shipper, bunker, charter, insurer, and the classification society, not to mention the officers and crew, are all of different nationalities, and uh, that none of these are from the country whose flag flies at the ship's stern, nor indeed from the country in which the ship was built. Moreover, because shipping's prime physical assets, the ships themselves, move continually between countries and between different jurisdictions, there is an overarching logic in favor of a framework of international standards to regulate the industry. Without internationally recognized and accepted standards, you might have the ludicrous situation that the ship leaves country A, bound to its cargo for country B, fully compliant with the country A's requirements for ship design, construction, equipment, manning, and operation, only to find that country B has its own different requirements. Clearly, there has to be a common approach so that ships can ply their trade smoothly and unimpededly around the globe, and countries receiving foreign ships can be confident that in accepting them in their ports or offshore terminals, they do not place their own safety, security, and environmental integrity at an, any unreasonable risk. I would of course preach to the converted if I rushed to explain 
that it is IMO with its 170 member states. Palau joined us a few weeks ago, so we have now 170 states vis-a-vis -vis the 193 of uh, the UN. And of course, you can uh, understand why not all of them are members of IMO. There are many long, long countries that have no interest in shipping and shipping operations. But we are catching up. Soon, the number will go up further. So it's IMO that develops and adopts these international standards. And at the risk of blowing our own trumpet, I think that shipping's continually improving record in terms of safety and environmental impact bears witness to the fact that we are doing a good job. I stress the word we because all the members vis-a-vis ourselves, IMO, and you, the European Union representatives. We, because all the members of the European Union are also members of IMO. Moreover, many of them, most of them, most of them, I would say, are active and influential participants in the work of the organization. Protagonists, I would say. While there can be no denying the gradual eastward shift in global shipping's overall center of gravity, and we see that the Far East is nowadays doing extremely well in this respect. It is equally true that some of the finest shipping mines are still to be found in Europe. Drawing on the accumulated experience and know-how of many generations, they bring insight and authority to the IMO debate, from which shipping's international regulatory framework emerges. The highly respected yet often different views of the European countries are of enormous value in establishing the technical foundations that underpin the regulatory framework. One can, of course, observe increasing efforts to reach consensus among the countries of Europe on many of the issues discussed at IMO. But there is no doubt that the participation of European nations in the organization's work individually adds intellectual vigor and rigor to the process and does much to ensure that the outputs are technically sound, well-balanced, and workable. The European Commission, on the other hand, is an entity in its own right, has observer status at IMO, in which capacity it makes a very positive contribution to the work of the organization. As part of my efforts to build strong links between IMO and Europe, I have made the point of regularly meeting the European Commissioners for Transport, for the Environment, Climate Change, and Maritime Affairs and Fisheries to ensure that there is a good channel of communication between our organizations and that areas of mutual concern can be discussed and addressed. The result is a good working relationship which operates to the benefit not only of the organizations themselves, but also of the stakeholders whose interests we serve and the public at large. It is based on the common understanding that on global issues, on global issues, IMO is the one who legislates and the Commission, through its executive branch, EMSA, seeks the implementation and enforcement of the IMO standards in European ports and European waters. While the global re regulations developed and adopted by IMO are wide-ranging and cover most aspects of international shipping, from the Naval Architects CAD -CAM package to the recycling facility, you might say, no set of regulations, however comprehensive, will be of much value unless they are not, th uh, unless they are properly implemented. And of course, with very few exceptions, IMO cannot, does not get involved in matters of implementation and enforcement. Arenas in which regional organizations such as EMSA have an important, indispensable, I would suggest, role to play. There are numerous examples of EMSA's activities and capabilities on the technical front, 
serving to underpin and enhance IMO's international regulatory framework by ensuring proper implementation in the, arm, in the realm of port state control in European waters, for instance. EMSA manages the CETIS database and delivers joint training programs for port state control organizations. It has also undertaken to develop and operate EU traffic monitor monitoring systems, not notably the safety net, as well as the system management of the EU data center long range identification and tracking of ships. In addition, EMSA monitors oil spills in European sea areas and helps in implementation and enforcement of the MARPOL Convention by identifying polluters through the Clean Sea Net Satellite Service. EMSA has also an operational pollution response task force and operates a fleet of 20 pollution response, ve response vessels in a public-private partnership which are spread along the EU coastline. There are, of course, many more examples I would mention, but I'm sure you know them all much better than I do. Not everything EMSA does is restricted to the regional sphere. The inspection of EU-based recognized organizations, for example, which includes several major classification societies, is carried out on a global basis, as is the inspection of national maritime training institutes in all seafarer providing countries, issuing diplo diplomas recognized by the EU and its member states, an activity that supports the IMO Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping for seafarers. From all this, it is not difficult to conclude that EMSA has come a long way since it first went operational back in 2003. From a staff of just six persons with initially no fixed abode, EMSA now employs some 440 people and is housed in this splendid, almost new permanent headquarters building, in the opening of which it was my pleasure to participate in 2006 to see what, what happens when agencies like EMSA try to copy the IMO example with our headquarters building, which has become the envy of the entire UN system with its functionality, workability, and operability. So congratulations, EMSA, on that. <laughs> that EMSA has, in such a short space of time, developed into such a sizable, capable, and effective agency is entirely fitting, given the maritime heritage of Europe and the importance of shipping to its members. No one could argue with the assertion that shipping and the maritime world as a whole constitute an integral part of the region's identity and prosperity. Consider for a moment that in terms of volume, some 90% of trade between Europe and the rest of the world is carried by sea. Among several EU member states, short sea shipping has become a key element in reducing congestion, ensuring territorial cohesion, and promoting sustainable development throughout the continent. Passenger ships and ferry services have a direct impact on the quality of life of citizens in islands and peripheral regions, as shown by the more than 400 million passengers that travel through European ports each year. Not only that, but Europe plays a major part in today's global maritime world. I already mentioned the central role that European countries continue to undertake in the shaping of IMO's objectives, policies, and strategies. European owners and shipping companies own more than 40% of the world's total fleet by dead weight tonnage, while in Europe today, one and a half million people find employment in maritime transport and related activities. And some 70% of shipping related jobs are onshore in areas such as shipbuilding, science, naval architecture, engineering, electronics, 
marine equipment, manufacturing, cargo handling, and logistics. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you were, I know, present in Poland in May when I had the privilege to address a conference to mark this year's European Maritime Day. As I marked on that occasion, the countries of Europe and others around the world are now clearly recognizing the major contribution made by maritime activities to their economies and the well-being of their people. There is a manifest acknowledgement that sea-based activities are both an essential element of and a challenge to sustainable development. And their intensification poses a significant test. A comprehensive, coordinated approach, ensuring safety and security in maritime transportation and sustainable development of the different sea resources and activities is the holy grail of maritime policy. With Europe's integrated maritime policy providing the blueprint for such an integrated approach, and with EMSA acting as the operational arm, ensuring that the policymakers' aspirations are met in practice, Europe's maritime domain could hardly be in better hands. And it is through this mechanism, to return specifically to the theme that I have been asked to address today, that Europe's regional contribution to the global issues that are addressed by IMO is maintained. Accordingly, the, organizations, the, the organization looks forward to a steadily progressing cooperation with EMSA and the Commission in support of our common objectives and in particular in joint initiatives such, such as the SafeMed programs executed by REMPEC in the Mediterranean. I'm very pleased that the director of uh, REMPEC is with us this morning. Which, which programs we stand ready to continue through our, any new phase that might be developed. In the same ve vein, I would appreciate very much the support of the European Union to the forthcoming Assembly of IMO, and in, and in particular their support for the Assembly Resolution on Piracy of Somalia that I have tabled. This is an issue on which we have to work together if we were to stem this unacceptable phenomenon and condemn piracy to the archives of, of history where it belongs. It is a stigma for the civilization of our century that piracy is thriving and more, some 300 seafarers are at present in the hands of uh, pirates on ships somewhere along the extensive coastline of uh, Somalia. I hope that European Union members coming to the IMO Assembly will support the resolution. And also that they will show those of the European Union members that have the political will and have the potential to make a difference, that they, they will show the needed political will to make a difference. And the other area where I would appreciate Europe's support is when at the end of the month we go to Durban in South Africa for the next round of consultations within the UN Convention on Climate, uh, on, on, uh, climate Change, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, following those in Bali, in Copenhagen, and in Cancun last year, where against the excellent results of IMO at the MEPC meeting in July, when amendments were adopted to Marvel Annex 6, introducing uh, operational and technical measures to enhance the energy efficiency of ships against this wonderful, unique uh, background. The conference in Durban will continue entrusting IMO with the regulation of shipping to reduce and control greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. Much of the credit for Europe's outstanding collective contribution to the issues I mentioned a short while ago can be laid at the door of a robust institutional model with EMSA at its heart. And although I should not discriminate as to who should be credited with this achievement, I trust you've, you'll forgive me for offering a special tribute today to my old friend and colleague, 
in the pursuit of quality shipping, Willem de Reuter. Willem, who steps down from his position as executive director of EMSA this year, it seems that uh, all great men step down at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the greatest of them all at the end of this month, another one less great than the greatest at the end of next month. So, Willem is a veteran of the European Commission, have been, having been appointed to the Directorate General for Energy and Transport as long ago as 1985. Since then, he has served shipping and Europe with great distinction, displaying a deep understanding of the issues that have confronted them and him, and their willingness and preparedness to seek effective and work up solutions and to see them through. There are so many examples one could cite, but I think his tenacity in seeking Europe's thorough and comprehensive response to the Erika and Prestige disasters deserves a very special mention in this context. At the beginning of 2003, he was appointed as the first executive director of EMSA. That just eight years later, he is able to pass on such a well-established, respected, and above all, effective institution is testimony not only to his vision and foresight, but also to his immense dedication, firm and unbendable attitude, and strong determination to succeed. I was prepared to paint Willem as the man who has the skill, courage, and human qualities that mark out all great leaders. When I realized that these were the words used by Andrew Lambert to highlight in his book entitled Admirals, the charismas of another great Dutchman, Admiral Michael de Reuter, hero of the Third Anglo-Dutch War of 1672. But it seems that great is in the genes of every Dutchman that bears the same name. <laughs> With Willem, I have something very important in common. We are both married to Dutch women. <laughs> so we understand each other well. <laughs> that was for you, Adam. <laughs> I have regretted it. I have not regretted it. <laughs> Willem, you, you'll, you'll be missed. You'll be missed very much. That much is certain. As indeed is certain that we'll miss very much Mr. Hürgen Hammer Hansen, the distinguished and widely respected chairman of EMSA's executive board, who also, I understand, ste steps down at the end of the year. But in Hürgen's case, this would not come as a surprise, as he had before joining the agency and his pairs at the battlefield of IMO. Moral lesson. You come to IMO first, where you distinguish yourselves, and then you move on anywhere else in the world where you thrive and excel. Gentlemen, your shoes will be very hard to fill. Ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, I understand from what I see here, a packed agenda and the host of distinguished speakers to listen to in what promises to be a fascinating morning. So I'll conclude by using this opportunity to, to bid you all my own farewell. It has been a pleasure, a great pleasure indeed, to work so harmoniously, constructively, and fruitfully with so many of you over many years especially during my time as Secretary General of IMO. Throughout my international career, I always tried to adhere to the motto, to bridge gaps, to build bridges, a motto that has served me well. And I like to think that uh, between us, we have built together an uh, unbreachable link, one that is strong and solid and as such, is destined to serve well although all those who rely on a safe, secure, and clean shipping industry for many, many years to come. Thank you.
thank you